Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm Ed Saxon. Um, I am a film producer. Those are some of the films I was part of producing up on the screen. More about those in a minute. I just wanted to say how excited I am to be here. Um, I think Google's the most uh, exciting company on the planet. Um, and uh, it, I'm intensely curious about it. And so to come here and talk about what I do when I'm so interested in what you do is really great. Um, I am not a major. This may be my first slide presentation, but I decided you're going into a culture where they use slides or have been known to use slides, so do a slideshow. So bear with me. Um, about Google, uh, this was said about Hollywood. Cecil B. DeMille was, uh, did, directed the Ten Commandments in the Silent Age, and uh, his brother said the trouble with Cecil is that he always bites off more than he can chew, and then he chews it. And I thought that was true of Google. I was going back through some of the the uh, mysteries of Hollywood, and uh, it reminded me of you guys. Um, a little bit about me, um, why I'm in the movie business. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Yes, yeah, St. Louis. St. Louis heard from the Show Me State. First in beer, first in shoes, and last in the American League in the old days. Um, now uh, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, let's see, Child of Divorce played prominently in my getting into the movie business. My grandmother was a rocket. I'm told. The Rockettes started as the Missouri Rockets. Um, and uh, my folks got divorced when I was four years old, but I saw my father every Saturday, and a good thing to do with a six, seven, eight, nine-year-old is take him to a double feature um, at the movies. So I went to a double feature every Saturday, and I think that's where I fell in love with the movies. I also loved politics. I thought I was going to be a litigator, a politician, Clarence Darrow Jr., or something like that. And then in college, I took an acting class and uh, found that I liked show people a lot, and I wanted to be in a culture of people who I really liked, and it was, and I like to work in an intensive kind of way with people in a close way and get to know them really well, and I liked the variety. Um, and so I thought I would be an actor. And I went to college up in Montreal at McGill University and started a theater with some friends and did the acting, and I thought, well, I, I like the idea of going to school. I like the idea of being prepared before I uh, did something, and I thought if I'm going to be an actor, I'm going to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in England where they don't take a lot of Americans. Laurence Olivier went there. It seemed like the perfect place to go. Um, and if I couldn't go there, I decided I'd do something else. That, that was my thinking at the time. They were very clear that they didn't need me at the Royal Academy of Dramatic <laughs> Art, and <laughs> despite my superb audition. And, I, um, and a friend of mine told me about a new program that was starting um, in film at the University of Southern California. Um, <clears throat> That is the Peter Stark Motion Picture Producing Program. It's now 20, 22, 23 years old, um, and I was in one of the first classes at Peter Stark. Ray Stark, who produced Neil Simon movies like California Sweet, um, Funny Lady, uh, Hello Dolly, a big producer, big interest in Columbia Pictures, um, endowed a school to teach people about producing. And the promise when you went to the school was they you'd know more about the movie business in total than 95% of the people in it. Um, and hopefully, when you got out, you'd be able to put that to good use. Um, there really wasn't a career path from the Peter Stark program in that producing is, and most of the film business, is very much an apprenticeship business. Um, if you're in the business side especially, also often in the artistic side. There are people who just go out and make videos and do dirt bike magazines, like my buddy Spike Jones, who did adaptation that you'll see later. Um, but for a lot of people, the way you work your way up, you work your way up to being an agent by working on an agent's desk, um, like Kat Ng, who works with Tom Williams, um, who was so kind as to invite me here. And um, uh, so for myself, after two years of listening to war stories, listening to people like me um, later on come and describe, studio heads come and describe, uh, how they would throw up before, behind movie theaters before previews and the pressures of the job and different stories about movies. Um, I, was, uh, I knew a fair amount, at least, about the structure of the business and the business from soup to nuts. And I took a job as an intern, unpaid, um, for the director who I ended up having a really successful partnership with, uh, Jonathan Demme, who had already made a couple of studio movies. And I remember uh, my second day as an intern on this PBS um, uh, half hour that starred David Byrne um, and Rosanna Arquette. I was picking up Jonathan's cleaning and his bubble gum, and I thought it was a phenomenal investment of $55,000 to have gone to graduate <laughs> school and be picking up someone's cleaning and bubble gum. But I read a lot of scripts, and I ended up um, 
finding um, a script that became the first um, movie that we did. Um, now, what does a producer do? You guys may know in the movie business there's a lot of confusion about it, and there's a lot of fighting about what a producer does. The Producers Guild has um, guidelines for what, who gets producer credit, and what I will say is that a producer, um, producer credit is not the same thing as what a producer does. A producer, the work of a producer may be spread among different people on different movies. The credit may go to a star's manager, it may go to a person who's financing a movie. The producing credit goes to the person who can get the producing credit. But it usually, um, in part, is held by the person who is the first creative impetus for the movie, the person who optioned the play, the person who read the magazine article and got the screenwriter hired. You can't make a movie without owning the script that the movie is based on, and so the person who has a claim to that script that the movie's made from um, is likely to be one of the people who's the producer. In the purest form of the job, and I've had the good luck to do it in a kind of pure form a number of times, um, in a less pure form as a director's partner other times, in the purest form of the job, you're there from the time you go, hey, let's do a movie about, until the video box comes out somewhere halfway around the world. Um, this is, uh, this is me on my most recent movie. I made a movie with Sam Mendes, who directed American Beauty and has Revolutionary Road coming out. Uh, later this year, um, we made a picture, uh, a road movie, called Away We Go for Focus Features that stars John Krasinski from The Office and Maya Rudolph, who you guys may know from Saturday Night Live. Um, <clears throat> so, what a producer does. Here's the real powerpoint part. Um, <laughs> you... Um, I like it. Simply, you move things to the next level. If you have an idea, you figure out how to get a script. If you have a script, you figure out how to get a director and cast. If you have a director and, and so on. Um, if you have a movie that is stuck in the editing room and doesn't have any music on it, you get the music put on it. The, the producer moves things up to the next level. You are the person primarily responsible for getting the movie made. Um, you've, that's, that's your job. Your job is to say, hey, you haven't responded to our budget yet, and then the studio calls up and says, it's too high. You know, that's, that's what the producer um, does. And in terms of where movies, so if you're this person, and if you're the creative impetus, where do you get, where do movies come from? I've been doing this for 20 odd years, and so a few of my movies um, have come from spec scripts. The very first picture that I got a chance to be a producer on was because a guy who was a single agent working out of his house in Malibu called me and said, hey, this kid just got out of NYU film school. He wrote a great script. He knew the director who I was working with wouldn't read it. The director was going to read offers or things that his agent sent, but he knew that as the assistant, I'd probably read it. And so it was the script Something Wild, written by the writer E. Max Fry, and I got it. I loved it. I said, you've got to read this. You know, movies get made a lot of times because people run into somebody else's office with their hair on fire and go, you've got to read this. So... Um, <clears throat> Something Wild was that kind of script for me. It turned out the director I was working for liked it. There was nobody else. It was just the two of us, so I was the producer. Um, I became the executive producer because Real Pros came in. I'd never been on a movie set, really, uh, for an extended period of time until it was the movie I was working on. Um, so Emacs Fry got his big break. He wrote a script in college, and uh, it turned into a picture because it was good. Um, Married to the Mob was the second picture I did. Again, NYU, a, a pair of NYU uh, <clears throat> film writing uh, majors who wrote a script. Um, they got it to Orion Pictures, who we'd made the previous movie for, turned it into a, a movie. A best-selling book, The Silence of the Lambs, was a bestseller. It had not, they'd made a movie about Hannibal Lecter, Manhunter, starring Brian Cox, who you will see if you stick around for the movie in adaptation. Um, but it hadn't been successful. William Peterson, Michael Mann directing, Hannibal Lecter, Really good story, remade as Red Dragon, kind of a, one of the shortest periods between making a movie and remaking it, less than 20 years. Um, and, but The Silence of the Lambs was something where we were at the studio, we wanted to make another movie, a spec script, again, that, we, that we'd fallen for, and they said, and Gene Hackman was supposed to direct the, sil the Silence of the Lambs. He had optioned it, he was gonna play Hannibal Lecter, and he was gonna direct the movie, and he decided that it was too, uh, a little too gory for him, I'm told. I've never talked to Gene Hackman about it. Uh, but uh, thank God that he didn't decide to make the movie. And um, we went off when we, we read the book and waited for the script, and when we got it, we thought it was spectacular. 
and told them, okay, we'll jettison that other project that we'd given you, Maxwell's Demon, still unmade. And um, it was the best-selling book that ended up being uh, the source for the movie. Um, an original idea. Um, in the case of Philadelphia, um, Jonathan and I and the writer of the movie, Ron Nicewanner, had been touched in the early 90s by the AIDS tragedy. We'd really been moved by um, you know, the fact that our friends were dying, and we were living in New York at the time, and different people in different ways. Ron had lost a nephew who'd gotten a blood transfusion, and Ron's gay. Um, I'd lost my college roommate, um, and <clears throat> um, Jonathan's wife's best friend was dying of AIDS. And we said, let's do a movie about AIDS, and if we do a movie about AIDS, we'd like it to be about homophobia, because we think that's wrought up with what's happening. Um, with AIDS, but people are just, were, at that time, a lot of you are too young to remember, were, were just dead scared of AIDS. We, I went to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, before it uh, was in its current incarnation, and we were putting HIV-positive Haitians in Guantanamo um, because they had HIV and because we didn't want to put them with the other immigrants that we didn't know what to do with. Um, so we wanted to do this movie, and we talked for nine months and said, what can we do a movie about AIDS? We looked at farmers in Minnesota in their communities and more, and um, and then Ron came up with this idea. He'd been talking to another producer who wasn't doing a whole lot with the idea and said, what if it's a movie about a lawyer who sues his own firm when he's fired because he has AIDS? And we took it to the studio and they said, who, well, who are we going to relate? Who's the guy who doesn't want to go see a movie about gay people, doesn't want to go see a movie about AIDS? Who's he going to relate to? And we came up with, uh, and they came up actually and said, what if there's another character? What if his lawyer doesn't like gay people and doesn't like people with AIDS and is afraid of people with AIDS? And that's how the Denzel Washington character uh, came up, and a, a producing partner of mine on that movie, Gary Getzman, was sitting next to Denzel on an airplane and gave him the script. And I remember we went to the studio, and they, uh, at first the studio's response was, I thought this was a movie about gay people. Now you're going to make a movie about black people and gay people? Which is, <laughs> you kind of, you know, at the time, with issue-oriented movies, you know, they like you to stick to the issue. Um, and um, so, an original idea. Um, and then, if you work with a very original writer like Charlie Kaufman, um, in the case of adaptation, which, were, which you're going to see, we optioned, with Columbia Pictures money, a New Yorker magazine article about John LaRoche, who's played by Chris Cooper. That's all it was about. It was about this guy who had a mad passion for the ghost orchid. Um, we hired Charlie Kaufman, and then um, Charlie spent a year trying to crack the movie. He couldn't, and then sent us... Uh, his idea, that's the brain there, Charlie Kaufman's brain, which decided to make, in which Charlie Kaufman and his fictitious brother becomes the main character in the movie. Um, so it can be an a newspaper magazine article coupled to an original idea, a very original idea on Charlie's part. Um, so what does a producer need? To make movies. You're only as good as your next one is a common um, uh, maxim in the movie business. And there's kind of a holy trinity as you're making a movie. Um, it may seem obvious. Um, it is, um, you need your script. You have, talent follows material. If you make movies, the difference, the, re, the way that you get actors like Tom Hanks or Nick Cage or anybody to cut their fee or great directors to work for either less money or on shorter schedules is that you have a great script. You have material that they want to do. And they want to usually want to do material that's risky. People want to do things that are exciting to them. It's less exciting for Nicolas Cage to do National Treasure 3 than it is to do something brand new. These guys are artists. So, um, so the script for a guy like me who is involved in developing material um, is everything. And it, the studios, the reason that they pay people the money that they pay them to write scripts is because they know that talent will follow material. There's a businessy business part of the business, no, no question, that's built on tent poles and making movies that you know, satisfy an audience. But if you're going to make artistic motion pictures um, the script is there and get them made, the script is uh, the whole deal. Then you need your cast, and your cast needs to match your budget. And you get more if you get bigger stars, obviously. And um, and then you have to come up with a budget that makes sense. You know, this is a business where you keep working if you make movies that uh, have some kind of a return on an investment. Usually that's a cash return on investment. Sometimes it can be a return in terms of prestige. You know, there are st people who run studios who have to make comedies that they think are kind of stupid and <clears throat> violent movies that they may not love. These are usually movie lovers, and so they may make, they'll, make, they'll give themselves a movie or two to make 
um, a year just for irra the irrational reason that they'd like to make a movie that they think is great that they'd like to go see themselves. Um, and so that can sometimes, uh, but usually your budget needs to be rational and the way they decide whether it's rational is they compare other movies uh, to your movie and see how it's done and decide whether it's worth the money. And of course you need a director and especially in high quality movies, um, your, direct, your, your cast frequently decides whether they're going to be in the movie or not just based on the director. Right? Martin Scorsese could get a phenomenal cast if he said, you know, my next movie is going to be about reading the yellow pages. And he'd get a lot of people to turn out uh, to show up for him because they want to work with him. And who can blame him? You, know, you, you want to work with um, really uh, great artists. A couple of war stories before I get to talk about the industry. Um, about the Silence of the Lambs, just to give you a sense of individual, kind of individual, individual product flow. Um, when we got the Silence of the Lambs, the studio said to us, um, uh, what do you think of Sean Connery or Jack Nicholson for Hannibal Lecter, who were the biggest kind of stars of their age at the time? And it was a studio that also said when those guys turned out not to be the guys, and we said no, um, said, okay, cast whoever you think is the best guy. Um, and Anthony Hopkins had thought he was going to be a movie star here in uh, California some 10 or 15 years before then, but was in the London company of a play called M. Butterfly when we watched him in a movie called The Good Father. And uh, Tony uh, and Jonathan went to visit him, and then he came for a read through, and he said, and uh, his take on he's a very simple he has a very simple approach to acting. He says the lines a hundred times in front of a mirror. Um, he memorizes it and he says it a hundred times. And, um, and his key to Hannibal Lecter, uh, actually ties into what you guys do, was to make Hannibal Lecter's voice uh, very similar to Hal the Computer's voice in 2001, A Space Odyssey. So when you see uh, Anthony Hopkins, he's, he's, it's, Anthony, it's Hannibal Lecter as Hal. Um, uh, that and that he, uh, he wouldn't blink. He didn't think Dr. Lecter would blink. And if you watch the movie, there's not much blinking behind that glass wall. Um, <clears throat> And uh, Jodie Foster had wanted to do the movie from the time that it was a book. She was tracking it. So hey, we were delighted because Jodie came forward. Having done The Accused, won an Academy Award. She was great. She was perfect for it. Um, uh, my job was to wrangle the FBI. We were, one of the, we were the first movie to shoot at Quantico um, <clears throat> and really shot at the FBI Academy, which, gave, which had, shooting in real locations can give a movie a lot of uh, verisimilitude, can excite the actors, it excited all of us, and we learned a lot. So we ended up with scenes in the movie once we toured Quantico um, that we never thought we'd have, and, we, and because Jonathan Demme is amazing at casting real life people and still getting performances, we ended up with a lot of FBI agents in the movie. At the beginning of the movie, Jodie Foster's running through an obstacle course. It's the guy who really is a SWAT obstacle course guy who comes and calls her off the course. Um, and it's the producer's job to call up SAG and explain why you're not giving their members enough work. But because we would fill the party scenes up, uh, we tended to uh, take care of that. This ad image came of, uh, <clears throat> which was an award image, um, kind of my favorite ad image of the pictures I've worked on. And one awards was a result of the producer helping our art department, which had created this death's head moth. Um, if we, we, we're not zooming in, but if we were to zoom, uh, I don't know how to zoom in, but if we were to zoom in, the, the moth is actually, um, the head of the death's head moth, the death's head, is um, an image of women's bodies created by a French artist whose name escapes me at the moment. But we'd used that as our logo through the making of uh, the film. We gave it to the advertising people and said, hey, maybe this will be helpful to you. And they, they put it onto uh, this poster and other posters, and it became an iconic image for the film, which we opened on Valentine's Day in uh, 2001. <laughs> Because horror movies are great date movies. When you go on a date and your date grabs your arm in that scary part, that's a, that's a, that's a, really, uh, a really great thing. Um, and obviously, um, the movie turned out uh, well for everybody. Um, Philadelphia, um, I started to tell this, you know, that for me, that's the most soup to nuts of my movies. I started to tell the story about. Uh, um, People Dying of AIDS, introducing Denzel's character. Um, Tom Hanks called up. You know, actors, good actors read a lot, and they read scripts to see that they might not be right for it. The time that we cast Tom Hanks, he'd done Punchline. I don't know if any of you remember that movie, but he really wasn't um, much of a dramatic leading man, a league of their own. He was a big comic star, and so he wanted to do something more serious. So Tom called us up and said um, <clears throat> we'd met him on a general meeting because he was interested in meeting 
directors and producers who were making serious movies. And um, uh, we were delighted. We didn't have anybody who we thought was better. And we wanted somebody who was, Tom Hanks was relatable. And so we really wanted a relatable star. And we thought he was a hell of an actor watching those movies. So we cast Tom. And uh, producer's job helped Tom lose 30, 20 or 30 pounds through the making of the movie. So Tom Hanks would get. Uh, he, he only ate what he was uh, brought by, a production by his key production assistant who was in charge because he had to look like he was getting sick because we made the movie and we had to chart the movie out in that way and we hired people who have AIDS. I saw the movie recently and it's amazing how many people aren't still around and a blessing for the people um, who still are. Um, then we got to the marketing of Philadelphia, which was an interesting, the producer gets involved in the marketing. It was interesting because we, you make a movie and you, you go, well, market our movie. And the studio uh, was saying, OK, you've got two of the biggest movie stars in the world. Do you want to go with AIDS and homophobia um, in the television commercials and on the posters? And we said, well, yes, we do, because we want people to know what they're, what they're getting into. Um, and, and that's part of it. And, um, and the studio, I think, you know, wisely uh, thought, no, th this is a movie about justice. And so uh, we got the old floating heads. And if you haven't seen uh, the Funny or Die uh, clip on the guy who makes the floating heads um, uh, posters. I commend it to you. There are a lot of, a lot of good posters in there. And we got, we got one of them, floating heads and a gavel. And you know that it's a movie about injustice. And that's what the television commercials look like. Um, and, um, and then the job became, with Philadelphia, dealing with contro some controversy. Because it turned out that uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning writer Larry, Larry Kramer went in the New York Times and denounced the movie as actually being uh, you know, um, not nearly brave enough for the difficult times we were in. And, and it created a good deal of uh, buzz. And for a uh, producer of a movie that's about what's going on in society, if you have a gift to make that kind of movie, you love controversy. Michael Moore loves controversy. You want people to keep talking about your movie after you're done buying, after you're done, uh, buying television. And, so, uh, and, and you like to make things that are provocative. So that's Philadelphia. Um, this will be the last of the kind of movie-specific things, adaptation. So it's a story in The New Yorker. Susan Orlean writes it about going to see John LaRoche, who collects orchids. We give it to Charlie Kaufman. If you stay for the movie, you'll see a scene in the movie where we have lunch with Charlie Kaufman. And, he, and uh, I'm not in, he wrote me out of the scene. But <laughs> Valerie Thomas, who was uh, my good friend and who was our development person developing scripts, um, uh, was at the lunch, and he said, I don't want to movie, do a movie about drugs or gun running or people falling in love, and that's a, that's a scene in the movie. And, uh, and he went away, and uh, we thought he was going to write this movie about, people's, about one guy's passion for something, about his strange passion for orchids and how he gets messed up with the law, and that it would be a comedy. And he sent, I remember the day he sent us the script, seven months late, um, it arrived, and I opened it, and it said, by Charlie and Donald Kaufman. And so I thought, not only didn't he, did he turn it in seven months late, but he, put, he co wrote it with some, Who was Donald Kaufman? We didn't pay Donald Kaufman. Why, did he, why is Donald Kaufman's name on it? I couldn't read it then. I had some meetings. I gave it to Valerie to go read. And Valerie came into my office 10 minutes later and she said, I'm in the movie. And I said, What do you mean you're, what do you mean you're in the movie? And she said, Well, I'm, in, I'm a character in the movie. And of course, I immediately read the script. And, she was a character in the movie, and Susan Orlean, who'd written the book that we'd waited for and that Charlie had worked from in writing it, um, not only was in the movie, but was addicted to a strange drug that the Indians have found called Pash. I hate to give that away, but it's not a big giveaway. And um, so I had to go have uh, lunch with Susan Orlean and hopefully go to a restaurant that had really good wine and explain to her that she'd written a great book in which she was a reporter, but in our movie, she was a drug addict. Um, <laughs> And she took it uh, like a champ and had a great time on a ride telling stories um, like this one. Um, Spike Jones had just directed Being John Malkovich. Here comes the director. We saw a working cut of Being John Malkovich, loved it. And um, Spike knew Nick Cage, and we gave it to Nick, and we were off to the races. Columbia Pictures said, oh, with Nick Cage and Spike Jones, if you keep the budget low enough, we'll make the movie. And they were um, very happy that they did. Um, despite the movie not being a tremendous success. One of those cases where a movie may not be a huge financial success, but was a big success to steam for them. Um, I thought, because you guys are dealing, you live in Hollywood, you're dealing with, you live in LA, you're dealing with Hollywood, I'd talk about a few things that um, I know about the movie business or think I know. Um, some maxims. Um, one, I've talked about this, talent is rare. Um, there are 
Now, now we can really prove it because there are millions of people on YouTube. And you know as you look and go through all those videos, they're not all Will Smith, right? <laughs> Talent is rare. And because writing, which is the source for the stories that we tell, um, is in part perhaps because of uh, you know, how much our attention is split between different media because writing is, is becoming a, a less common art form and basic literacy is on the wane and all that stuff. Um, great scripts are even rarer and harder to come by than they ever were. Um, <clears throat> Sam Goldwyn, uh, who founded Metro <laughs> Golden Mayor, said you know, way back when, I'd hire the devil himself if he'd write me a good story. Sam also said, um, Anybody who goes to a psychiatrist uh, should have his head examined, and uh, a lot of other great uh, maxims. Um, William Goldman, who wrote, uh, this is one that you may be familiar with. William Goldman wrote Adventures in the Screen Trade about his work. He wrote All the President's Men, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, most famously. He came to us when we, sh when we showed him the last cut of The Silence of the Lambs before we locked the, pic before we locked the picture, and he had us, um, and there's a scene in the original picture where Jodie Foster gets fired from the FBI. And we thought, well, that's crucial. She gets fired from the FBI, and she takes off to go look for the girl herself. And Bill saw it, and he said, you know, you don't really need that scene where she gets fired from the FBI. You can just cut from her getting in trouble to being out on her own. And it was a huge improvement to the movie. So here's the, this brilliant screenwriter saying, who knows a lot, saying nobody knows anything. And um, what he means is um, that uh, not only don't people know uh, whether a movie has great potential often and disagree about it at script level, and that's true because movies are frequently, a movie like E.T. was passed on by Columbia Pictures. They decided not to make E.T. And TriStar Pictures decided not to make Pulp Fiction. And a third of the movies that get made are movies that come out of what they call turnaround from one studio to another. So nobody really knows what they have. It's an alchemy that has to take place as you make, as you make a movie and different people have different ability to read scripts. I myself can uh, have the great uh, um, distinction of having thought that uh, the opera scene in Philadelphia that helped get Tom Hanks' Academy Award was just going to be this over-the-top gay opera scene. And because I couldn't figure that we'd cut, that Jonathan would cut to Denzel Washington and Denzel's reactions would be so moving or that Tom would give such a performance. So y people can disagree. Nobody really knows anything. That's true even after movies are made. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, the Blair Witch Project. People walked out of the Blair Witch Project thinking at Sundance, thinking it was completely uncommercial. My Big Pear Creek Wedding, one of the uh, partners in that, F, that movie went on to be at the time the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time. And people who'd invested in it saw it and w were hoping to get their money back um, <clears throat> after seeing the movie. Um, so nobody knows anything. Um, Everybody thinks they can do it. Uh, it's a famous saying from the old days. I don't, I don't, uh, you don't need to raise your, raise your hand if you're not writing a screenplay. That's pretty good. Quite a few screenplay writers. And um, if you don't think you have a good idea, a better idea for a movie than maybe some of the ones that, that, that are out there, um, you'd be in the minority. Um, people think they can do it. I would argue, having been in the movie, Having accepted Friends of Friends scripts, I now have a rule that Friends of Fri Friends have to read Friends of Friends scripts before I read them. Um, but um, if you, um, it actually takes a good deal of expertise to be able to do something like write a screenplay, usually, which doesn't mean that some people don't have a lot of talent and knock it out of the, you know, J.K. Rowling is J.K. Rowling, and there are J.K. Rowlings in the screenwriting business too. But uh, just as, you know, you tend to take People who've done it a few times, it you know, takes some mastery too often to, uh, to be able to do it. Everybody um, can't do it. That's obvious. Um, the public makes stars, and it's up to the producers and, uh, to try to find them. Uh, there's Will Smith. And um, there are hundreds of thousands of stars and starlets in the making who come to Los Angeles, tens of thousands of scripts. We asked about who wasn't working on the script. And there are just 300 to 600 feature films that get um, beyond four screens, probably only a couple hundred more that get to four screens. Um, so you've got, so there's a funnel, and the, the funnel tends to be that people pass it along if they think it's really great. Um, you know, it's, it's that kind of business. Uh, this year, just yesterday, Sundance announced the 118 movies that they're going to um, be showing this year, and uh, they got 3,600 feature-length submissions. 
uh, foreign and domestic. So there are, there are, there's a lot of heartbreak in the movie business. If you work as hard, do as much, it takes as much work to make more work often because you don't have the same resources to make you know, a little hour and a half movie as it does to make a big hour and a half movie. There are fewer hands to do the work and uh, out of those 3,600 submissions, most of them, you know, the vast majority of them, not only won't get out um, on uh, <clears throat> a theatrical screen, but won't be seen on DVD. Um, Now, this about the movie business. It started 100 years ago. A quick, I want, I want to talk a little bit about where, um, where our industries are meeting. I feel like we are, uh, there's, there's a shotgun marriage happening. It's got to happen, right? There's digital convergence. I've been hearing about it for, for a long time, and now it's really going to happen. People are going to get their movies through that pipe into their home um, that's going to be controlled, uh, and how they find them will have a lot to do with you guys. Um, so Hollywood is going to be in business with uh, Google in a bigger way than uh, it w whether it wants to be or not, you know, finally, you know. And um, so a little bit about things from our side because um, <clears throat> this is still from the Great Train Robbery. Our, this, it's 100, 105 years ago, the Great Train Robbery was made. It's 12 minutes long. People ducked when the train came at them, and it was the first picture where people figured out that cross-cutting could work. You could cut to an old lady in a rocking chair, and then you could cut to a guy sitting on a train, and people go, oh, that must be his grandmother. Um, people didn't know that the, that, that connection would be made. Um, and um, in 1915, D.W. Griffith makes a movie called The Klansman, later retitled for political purposes, The Birth of a Nation. It's three hours long, but it cements the future of narrative storytelling. Narrative movies are going to be somewhere between 80 minutes and about three hours long. And for the next 90 years, that sticks, right? So Birth of a Nation, humongous hit, <clears throat> pretty much sets what Hollywood uses as the template for the length of movies, how you tell a story um, from then on. Obviously, there are other movies being made, but this was um, kind of one that's, that, that, especially for the bigger epic type movies, uh, set the tone. Um, star, si star system is starting at about this time. Um, there are, I'm, I think there are three seismic events in the history of the motion picture business, and um, the first of them is sound. In the um, 1927, Warner Brothers makes the jazz singer. Um, is this what's my next? And. Ha ha <clears throat> Harry Warner um, said, uh, as they were making the movie at Warner Brothers, uh, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? And it turned out that people didn't want to hear those actors talk. Um, when sound came in between 1927 and 1933, um, the actors, the directors, and the writers pretty much all changed over. Um, the, the same people who were stars of the silent era were not stars in the sound era. Um, the producers stuck around. But uh, the people who wrote the title cards weren't the same. You tended to hire more playwrights, and the business changed over. It was a seismic shift um, in the history of the movie business. After sound comes in, in the 30s, um, there are major studios that emerge because they control the distribution of movies, right? There's Paramount Pictures, Warner Brothers, Universal, MGM, and Columbia. Um, those. Studios controlling distribution, having a library where they can uh, to protect them if they have a bad year, right? Um, and own, in those days, owning theaters until 1948 when they had to sell them. Um, in terms of the structure of the business, these were the dominant, uh, the dominant players. Flash forward to 2008, and the dominant players in the motion picture business are. Walt well, Disney just starting in the 30s, and Paramount, Warner Brothers, Columbia, Metro Golden Mare, and Universal. This is, a mature, this is a, an industry in which not a lot has changed. I mean, these, these companies are a part of conglomerates, right? Walt well, Disney owns ABC, Paramount's part of Viacom CBS, Warner Brothers' part of Time Warner, but the studios themselves, the people, I met a guy when I was at Columbia in the uh, <clears throat> mid-1980s who had been there when Frank Capra movies, so he'd been there for 45 years. There was a guy who'd been, you know, who went 
way back. These, these companies, companies have personalities, and God, you guys work in a company that has one of the great personalities, right? A famous personality. Companies have personalities, and those personalities stick around. And they have ways of doing things. So what studios are used to doing is trying to find someone else to finance your movies as a matter of uh, course and controlling your own distribution. The reason that these studios have stuck around is if you make a movie. In fact, anybody can go out and make a movie if you can raise the money, right? You can get the money from a consortium, a dentist, wherever you, you get the money to go make your movie. And, but then you've got to get people to see your movie. and You've got to get it into theaters. And if you sell it to theaters, then you have to figure out how to collect from those theaters. And that's always a problem for independents. It has been for all the independents that fell by the wayside as they came up, were announced. Even Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and David Geffen with DreamWorks couldn't maintain a distribution company. Um, so you come, so these come, so that what happens is you make your movie, now you've got to collect. You also want your movie uh, these days to be shown on television. Who's going to sell it to the television network? You want it to be shown around the world. These are worldwide distribution companies with uh, distribution arrangements around the world. So that's a, um, uh, it's, a, it's also a business where 20% of the movies pay for the other 80% that don't do so well. These companies, again, big enough to withstand it if it turns out that you have a 90-10 year one year um, where 90% of the movies don't work well and only 10% of the movies work well. Um, <clears throat> They, these companies also have a lot of expertise, right? They have expertise in marketing um, that is really significant. Um, they have expertise in finishing movies and helping to make them better. Um, so that's the studio system. Here's the next seismic shift. It's television. In 1948, 4 billion people bought There were 4 billion tickets sold in the United States to go to the movies. By 1973, 720 million tickets were sold to go to the movies. We lost over three quarters of our audience and almost entirely to television, to three networks, right? Not Google, not the internet, um, because people could stay home. That 720 grew to about a billion. It stayed in somewhere close in the range of a billion, billion, two billion, four. Um, since then, a healthy, that's kind of the healthy, uh, Admissions keeps the movie go keeps them keeps uh, the movie business going level of admissions, but television was a major seismic change for the movie business. It meant that it had to tell different stories. We had to tell stories in a different way than were being sold on uh, than than they were being told on television, um, and it meant that um, it meant that we uh, had to be good enough or appeal to a specific enough audience to get people out of the house. Um, my belief is that people will continue to go to the movie. Whatever happens with digitization, the cannibalization of DVDs by the internet, all these nightmare scenarios that we all play out in our minds who work in Hollywood, um, that uh, people will continue to go to the movies because it's a cheap date, because it's somewhere that you can go out and see something on a big screen. And 3D may help, et cetera, but nothing has replaced movies as something that you can do with other people um, that doesn't cost you a whole lot of money and that takes a few hours. Um, a little bit about what's happened as we approach this digital, just to give a sense of why the internet seems like such a threat to those of us who work in Hollywood, and that certainly digital file sharing does, is in the old, before 1948, you got all your money from showing the movie in the theater around the world, but you got, that was the only source of income, right? Nobody got, you might sell a few records, um, but, and if you were the, before 1948, you also sold popcorn if you were Paramount, right? Because the Paramount is in different, when you go to a city and you see the Fox Theater, the Paramount Theater, that's because the studios own those theaters. So they made some money from concessions, but they got, you had to get all your money. If you made Gone with the Wind, you had to get all that money from the theaters. You might put the movie out again, but it all came from the theaters. Well, the good news, or the bad news about television was we lost three quarters of our audience. The good news about television was we could sell movies to television. So, Network sales and theatrical and network sales and syndication sales in the 1950s and 1960s were a brand new source of revenue. The studios also went in the television business. That's not my business. But now you've got this brand new source of revenue. And then um, just as you think that's starting to wind down, and uh, HBO comes along, and now there's pay cable, and you can sell a movie to pay, you can sell a big successful movie to pay cable for 10 million dollars. And then in the 80s, VHS comes along, and now we can sell movies to video stores for $100 a copy, right? That's what movie, 95% of the movies sold for $100 on VHS. You know, if you, if you see an old VHS 
cassette lying around, just think that probably cost $100 when it was sold for the first time because it was a rental business. So we sold movies to the video stores so that they could rent them out again and again, and they cost 100 bucks. And then in the 1990s, DVDs came along, and we thought, hey, for 20 bucks, people will buy it. They'll go, wow, if I went to the movie theater, it cost me 32 bucks to buy four $8 tickets. I'll buy it for 20, and we'll show it to six people. I'm a winner. And that, um, so DVDs came along. Um, then in 2000, and kind of all throughout, video on demand is kind of creeping in there. So we lost three quarters of our audience, got a quarter of it back. And today, the theatrical box office around the world represents 20% of our revenue. We get 80% of our money in this 80-20 business from <clears throat> pay cable. And, we like to, and what we like to do is maintain all those windows, right? First, you show it. You get, we don't want to lose any of those, because it's all good. You get $10 million from HBO in a big movie. You get, um, then you get your video. Then you get, and video on demand will be slightly after DVD, because that's good for us, because we can get the DVD money. And, the, and nobody likes when you get, HBO doesn't like it if you put the movie out. Um, on a, the video guys don't like it if you put it out too soon on HBO, HBO, et cetera. So you've got windows for your movie. Um, so the mindset of Hollywood, right, is that the system's working, and then comes seismic event three, the <laughs> internet. <laughs> and it's inventor. Um, so, um, so we've got big, now we've got big problems, right? Um, we hope that we can uh, solve them together. But Hollywood needs to adapt to the web, and uh, somehow the web is going to ha have to figure out if we're going to keep making these kinds of movies, how to pay for content. Um, and, um, you know, so we have a problem that we're losing audience to new forms of entertainment, you know, that people do, may not, may want to play rock band or Guitar Hero or surf the web, um, and then we've got the other problem, and, we, and we're, we're ready to compete in that area generally, right? We'll, we'll say, okay, well, we have to make better movies. We're going to lose some people, but they're still going to want to go to the movies, watch stories, hour and a half long, two hour stories. That goes back in time a long way to the cavemen, and so they'll still want to see our stories. But piracy and, fires, piracy and file sharing are another matter altogether, and that's the problem that uh, Hollywood needs to solve. Um, I'm conscious. Um, that this can be a win-win situation, right? There are opportunities that we're going to, you guys, the internet can help us get movies out on demand. Uh, there don't have to be prints with digital distribution to theaters. There's a long tail, right? There are people who like all kinds of movies that don't know that they exist, much less how to see them or have access to them. There's no middleman. I mean, or, or there's certainly not a theater owner who's got your money and holds it for six months before they give you uh, the money or a network that doesn't have any incentive to pay you because of their fiscal year. Um, you can target potential audiences um, with reduced marketing costs, right? Now suddenly um, I made the documentary The Parrots of Telegraph Hill and I knew all I knew what to do was to put it in a theater in San Francisco. And it's a, that's a wonderful documentary, right? How do, you, how do you, now it turns out there are parrot lovers all over the place and maybe you guys can help us find the parrot lovers. Um, and if we're going to get some money, maybe it turns out that the guys who, that all those parrot lovers buy parrot feed. And maybe part of the way that we'll get money is by selling parrot feed off the back of the parrots of Telegraph Hill. Um, or the moment that you facially recognize that a parrot is watching, you have it squ squawk so that it will tell its owner to buy the parrot feed. Um, so <laughs> that's going to happen. Parrot recognition is around the corner. We're counting on you guys to do it. Um, the, um, I was going to do one more thing before I take questions. If anybody has any questions or introduce the movie or whatever is indicated, thank you for all your time and patience. Um, and that was just to look at the current, I, you guys are YouTube, and um, I thought we'd see how, how I'm doing on YouTube. You know, uh, YouTube just made a deal with MGM, I read, and MGM will not give YouTube the rights to show They'll, show, they'll let you guys show American Gladiator and a few of the lesser movies, but they won't let you show the gems of the MGM library. What's one of the MG, gems of the MGM library? What's one of those gems? The Silence of the Lambs. They will not let you show it. Well, let's go onto YouTube right now and take a look. <laughs> let's see. Oh, I forgot to plug this in. And 
just so you know, we'll go right here. Jump ahead a little bit. This is a scene from The Silence of the Lambs. I want to see if you recognize one of the actors. Jodie Foster is um, in a car. She's looking for uh, a clue that Hannibal Lecter told her to search for. Yes, my appearance in The Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> Benjamin Raspail, decapitated in Paris, a transvestite. Um, available on YouTube for no money. Um, I made a few movies for Orion, which was acquired by MGM. Um, Miami Blues, you can go watch that on YouTube today. Um, Yuli's Gold in 10 parts, I think it's in 12 or 13 parts. You can go watch that on YouTube today. Adaptation, if you guys uh, don't want to stick around for the movie, watch it on YouTube. Um, Something Wild on YouTube, Fast Food Nation on YouTube. As you can see, uh, YouTube, despite whatever fabulous copyright recognition programs you have built into, <laughs> built into YouTube, um, for those of us working in Hollywood, you can find our stuff on YouTube. Um, one of the um, things I do love about YouTube, and this will be uh, the last of what I have to share, is um, is user-created content as it relates to your movies. Um, I produced the movie That Thing You Do, and uh, <clears throat> this video was uh, created by a class um, at a, whoa, at a, this is from a private school in Singapore. We'll go to one more. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Brandon Hardesty. Um, he seems somewhat popular. Um, There you go, Brandon Hardesty. Um, Brandon has also um, uh, reenacted a number of other wonderful movies, including the Big, the Big Lebowski. I recommend his reenactment of the Big Lebowski to, to, to everybody. Um, so that's kind of it. The future depends on our cooperation, at least from my point of view. And so maybe we all have uh, good luck and prosper. I'm really uh, grateful to have the chance to talk to you guys. And if there are any questions or if we should show the movie, um, uh, let's do that. I am going to, I'm going to show a, uh, before we start the movie, I will show you something that no one has seen, um, except the people who worked on it. It requires a little bit of explanation. When we made, um, in adaptation, um, Nicholas, K uh, Charlie Kaufman's brother Donald has written a movie called The Three, in which, um, uh, He's taken a screenwriting course, and he's decided that there's a cop, a killer, and a victim, and they're all the same person. And, um, and we put together a trailer for the three and got um, uh, kind of just vi visuals. It's not the greatest copy. I got it in a hurry. But I think you'll be able to tell what's going on. And, um, uh, and we got uh, Tom Hanks and Catherine Keener and Willem Dafoe to help us make it. And uh, nobody's seen it, so I thought it'd be fun to see it. It's only about a minute and a half long. Um, but before I do that, that's probably good. I thought it'd be good to show a trailer before a movie, even though it's a trailer for a movie that hasn't been made that's described in the movie. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions? Anything? Yeah, I have a question. 
How you doing? So I'm one of the engineers on YouTube down here. Oh, wow. We work on specifically community features a lot. And I'm curious, have you interacted with your fans a lot using YouTube, or what would you like to see more for, to make it easier for you to interact with your fans? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. I hadn't thought about that at all. I'm using YouTube. I use YouTube um, in, um, Justin uh, Bell, who's, who works with me, who's here, and I, um, and we use YouTube as a research tool. We're making, for example, we're making a film about um, the people breaking records in the Guinness Book of World Records, and so we go to YouTube and collect them, or we make, a, if we're doing something about a specific place like Shanghai, China, we collect it, so we make a, a playlist based on different projects that we, that we might have. Um, that's a great question. It's a great question for managers, especially. Um, for us in marketing, it, I can imagine a situation where it could be great for us in a kind of testing, right? Because we're, especially in making advertising materials, we're always interested in what people want to see. In, you know, the, in the tentpole business, people go down to, um, people go down to Comic-Con and put elaborate presentations on. Um, and everybody thought snakes on a plane was going to be the viral phenomenon, and there, you know, there are various places. But to really find out if people are interested enough to, if John Krasinski stars in a movie, John's an emerging star. It'd be fascinating to hear what John's fans think of John, and, and perhaps to use it as a marketing tool to share information, and maybe to hear from fans you know, directly, or to create more, uh, more um, stickiness between a celebrity and their fan base. You know, the, these are guys who are used to having cameras around, and if there was a way on YouTube that you knew what they're, it, it, that's an interesting thing to wonder about. I don't know uh, specifically, but I know that the job is to create um, a connection with potential, a potential audience, you know, on, what, on many different levels. And so, to the degree that you think of somebody, think of YouTube, and then have some, something new, that's great. I mean, DVD extras are a reason that people end up buying the second and third and fourth editions of The Silence of the Lambs, you know, in my case. Cool, thank you. Yeah. So I browse around YouTube a lot, or at least I've mostly traded it in for television, but uh, you see a lot of uh, videos on YouTube as you're randomly browsing of uh, uh, people where you, you would think that what they're really trying to do is find somebody in Hollywood who would hire them for something or something useful. How, I was curious how often does that actually happen or is their effort mostly wasted? Because it seems like they try to build a fan base and then uh, once they become popular enough, they assume that either the media is gonna pick up on it or somebody in Hollywood is, is gonna hire them for something interesting. I can tell you one thing that happened. My daughter, who's 11 years old, is a big fan of Fred. And I don't know if you guys follow Fred, but um, Fred talks like this. And um, yeah, I think Fred's about 14, and so Fred's a YouTube phenomenon. And somebody I heard is, I, I, it makes sense to me. Go get Fred's rights, deal with Fred, make a deal with Fred, put Fred, like, when someone achieve, if you achieve critical scale, critical mass in some way, or if you're a viral phenomenon, you're interested, the, the person who directed Ready, Set, Go is gonna direct a movie. Um, you know, the treadmill video, et cetera. So, so the big things break out because they get passed around virally and people pay attention. Um, in terms of, uh, I could have played, you know, a woman doing, imita imitating movies doesn't tend to um, uh, help people break out. But I think more than anything, it's, it's, it's a way to share, in, as much as anything, it's a way to share information about somebody. So if I saw something that I thought was spectacular, I might share it with a casting director or share it with a director or something, uh, something of that sort. So for, I think for filmmaking talent, some people, this is, this is how people find their, you know, Boy, this is how you do your demo, essentially, these days, often. And so, while I don't feel generally that there's a vast reservoir of undiscovered talent that has just been waiting for YouTube so that they could be discovered, I feel like it will be, that talent will be discovered more quickly sometimes as a result of, uh, of YouTube. And so, so given the fact that uh, Al Gore invented the internet, oh yeah and YouTube, and maybe he's the one who is uploading all the movies. I want to understand, from your point of view, what is the happy medium that we can achieve in order so that both the studios as well as you know, the consumers of YouTube can benefit from this phenomena, as you, as you described, one of the shifts that happened. So going back to Napster, people like Metallica opposed it. But 
there were a good amount of people who liked it. And personally, I, I buy more music off Pandora than, than I would normally. So what is, the, what, what is it that we can achieve so that it becomes a mutually beneficial you know, ecosystem? I think it's a, great, it's a great question. And I think from the point of view of the studios, what is necessary is to look at the current moment and to look at the future and not look backwards and be nostalgic about what we once had, which was complete control of our product. So I, for the movie business, the music business is a tremendously cautionary tale. And how can we add value? Let's, let's be partners in figuring out how we reach people with experiences. That's our job, right? Your experience is to help people find what they want. Our experience is to give them something that they think is compelling enough. So I think the question is, how do we team up uh, to do that? I think there are any number of models. I think people don't want to, there's a, there's a group of, the majority of people are ready to pay if it's, if it's easy and rational. And the problem is that it's really confusing. I mean, people now have figured out Hulu, I think, and a lot of people go watch their programs on Hulu. That's successful. You know, that's working. And so the question is, with the kind of capital investment that it takes to make and market a movie, how do we come up with something where we go, oh, wow, you know what, we could maybe market this movie. Um, you guys are going to win down the road um, with uh, this when it's distributed digitally and you put it on YouTube. We're going to have to market it in theaters. How do we make this a win-win? So, you know, what are those partnerships that are going to be innovative that end up working for everybody? If you if it's putting it, if it's that, you know what? There's a way, there's a time when this can't then when this when we'll help keep this off of YouTube and, and you guys have to figure out hey if we keep it off YouTube, that doesn't mean it won't be somewhere on the off the on the internet. Why should we keep it off YouTube? There are a lot of intellectual property issues and who owns what. But I think what, <coughs> what it really will depend on is people going, um, how can we be client centric? How can we be customer centric in making? Um, making things work. It's a general answer to the question of where it is, but I feel like working uh, through the courts and working through, you know, working through the courts and working through lawsuits is going to be a lot less, and, you know, and, and generally trying to compete is going to be a lot less um, uh, productive than trying to cooperate, because I think that this needs to be, that there's, there's a compelling argument for the reason that we want this to be a win-win situation. People want the movies to survive, and people will like movies to have budgets so that people will make interesting, interesting films. The problem with the 3,000 movies that didn't get distributed was they weren't good enough, and you have to get people to make the decision that, they, that movies are a good investment if they're going to be investing in them to get good movies. So, um, so I think, there, again, there's promise in it, but it's about, I think it's about cooperation, dialogue, and creativity in uh, getting to the customer. And you guys are incredibly innovative. You know, I, um, I just sat sitting with Tom for a few minutes. I, you know, I was like, "All right, we could do that. We could target." You know, hearing about marketing is. You know, so I think, you know, I don't run a studio, but coming down here and talking is a good. You know, coming down here and talking and, and creating, especially for you people in Los Angeles, helping people to understand where Google's coming from and you understanding some where the studio where studios and financiers are coming from is going to create the dialogue that could lead to some kinds of real solutions. And, not, and escape, you know, what's happened in the music business, which hasn't been good for anybody. It hasn't been good for the artist. I mean, I work with artists who now distribute their own material, and they, you know, and they make their money from, it's hard if you make your money from touring and merchandising. You know, and, and, and I, I don't think that's the answer. And so I think we, we want to be a little bit, you know, global in our thinking. There's, you know, I, there's plenty to talk about. I think the other thing that's possible that I didn't deal with here and that's happening is, because the internet is a global phenomenon, I do think that voices will be given to a lot of people in, um, it, where, where the means of production don't exist in the same kind of way, um, where people will have a chance, filmmakers from around the world will have a chance to say things that they haven't said. And I think there's talent out there um, and talent that will work inside of countries that has never happened. I've spent a lot of time in the country of Haiti and the idea that there could be bandwidth in Haiti and that a Haitian kid could go make something is beyond, you know, in a poor country like that, beyond the pale. But with cell phones and, you know, people congregating around different nodes, it's possible that, you know, emerging cultures will be able to express their culture in ways that have never been possible before. And that's, you know, that's one of the potential kind of miracles of uh, the digital revolution in terms of, uh, kind of, you know, just expressing culture around the world. It homogenizes culture because everybody consumes it, but what's happened in the last 20 years is actually indige indigenous cinema has made a comeback in, uh, in a lot of different countries because the costs of production have gone down to do the most basic stuff and people want to see movies about their own people. Um, How do you recommend 
reconcile the idea of the windows that you were talking about, the studios being so addicted to, with, you know, your, your interesting and charming notion that people find movies a great cheap date, which I agree with, but, but you know, that's just supposing they want to go to a theater where they have kids and they can put them to bed and they've got an HDTV, and the fact that they don't have to wait for a window anymore necessarily to watch it at, you know, impressive quality in, in their house for free. Now, I agree they'd be willing to pay if there was an option to do it, but it sounds like this addiction to these money-making streams. Uh, That's the reason, right? You've got to piss off your cut. The, it was... Joe Levine, who was like this great showman producer in the 70s, talked about in 10 years, with, they'll come out with these cassettes, and we'll make all the money back in one night. Right? That's, and people have been talking for a long time. With Star, let's imagine that the next Star Wars was going to play day and date in the movie theaters, and there are plenty of people who will go see Star Wars in the movie theaters, and we're going to charge 15 bucks, a lot more than we're going to get on us, and we're going to distribute it on you got to put in your credit card, and we're going to put it on that night, one show only, and um, we're going to show uh, Star Wars and deliver it to the Apple TVs and the TiVos and the whatever digital device, or you can order it as a pay-per-view. Um, and let's make Star Wars, no windows. Let's make Star Wars um, available to, uh, the next Star Wars available to everybody and have a $700 million night. Hollywood's never had a $700 million night. Who's had a $700 million night? That'd be great. Um, and everybody would be happy. And then you could sell whatever people want to buy later, too. You could still sell toys, all that stuff, and we'll have that great $700 million night. And we'll probably have a $150 million weekend in the theater, too. $850 million weekend. I'm universal, and I sell to Showtime. And they gave me $150 million last year for all these movies that, I, that didn't actually do so well. They gave me six for this one, and I, that's how I rationalized all the costs, right? I'm going to get $6 million for this one. I'm going to get three for this one. And so... I have to call up the guys at Showtime and go, you know what, we're doing a sequel to The Mummy and we're going to just skip you guys this time. And that's, that's a big part of the problem. That's why windows between, that's why there are a lot of theaters that still will not book, if you said you were going to go on television in any form, in DVD in any form, there are theaters that won't play your product today um, because theatrical windows first. I've already got people watching videos at home. You're not telling me anything. I, want, I don't want them to be watching the one that I'm showing at home unless they got it illegally. So part of the problem is you have to be willing to kill the old business or to hurt the feelings of the people who are in the old business um, in order to move on with the new business. So it's taking in more innovative companies to take those chances. And, uh, that's, but that part of the problem is you don't, want to kill the, you don't want to kill the cash cow that's feeding you today before you have a model for tomorrow. But the problem is that it's keeping you from having a model for tomorrow. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Does that make sense? My question is you're creating patterns of behavior for people yeah. where they think it's completely acceptable to go fire stuff. It's becoming easier for people to know. It's going to be increasingly easier to, to find that content in the quality. Couldn't agree more. I subscribed to Rhapsody for a while. I, 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 and, I, and if you run the numbers and go, hey, why doesn't studios all get, nobody has been able to do this. Studios, why don't you all get together? If you can charge 70 million people, 300 bucks um, a year, let's say. Pick a number, right? I mean, you're making the television show. These are big companies, right? Use, that, use the size of your company to... You only have to get six, pe six companies together, and it won't be, nobody's going to come at you for restraint of trade, let's say, and now let's come up with a model. And if you get, I don't, you know, I need a better, there are people who can do this math in their head in this room. But if you get um, people who are paying 200 bucks, say, uh, 200, 300 bucks a year, you've got 40 billion people, it adds up to more money than the movie business. It adds up to a lot of money if you get the subscription one. And people might buy into a subscription. Everybody would go, Oh, I got, yeah, I'll pay that. I don't have to go out and buy all those DVDs, and I don't have to figure out how to steal it, and it all just comes to me, and all i got to do is write that one check, and then you fight about whether it goes to the cable company, how much Fios gets, who, what does Google get. You know, you've got some more stuff to figure out. I'm not saying it's simple, but whether it's a subscription model, whether it's download, the danger and what we're moving towards, I agree with you, Tom, is I think we're moving towards, uh, you know, it's, they say, fool me once, um, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, and I think what is in, there's a danger of happening with the entertainment businesses that we got fooled uh, in the case of uh, 
the music business. And uh, what's George Bush say? It won't get fooled, it won't get fooled, whatever, it won't get fooled again, whatever that is. I don't know much. The Nigerian film industry? Yeah. Like the, the new Nollywood term as the next step of what India, India has in Hollywood. Well, I think, I, what I think is that um, cultures are, or the studios have gone out. I have a friend who was a movie executive, and the studios have gone out and actively invested in local language um, product because there are new places to show it and ways to monetize it and star systems to be created and the whole thing, right? You can own a lot of it, right? You can have a radio station and go into these countries and make partnerships and help them figure out how to have an entertainment business and a movie business. So I'm not, I'm not I, I don't know what's happening in Nairobi, but um, I know that in um, places all over the world, Warner Brothers wants to be your partner and Disney wants to be your partner because these are global entertainment companies and they want to be part of, because, something they can put on uh, their systems that's specifically for you. So um, it's, it's become a business, in part because there's more money over there, right? Um, you know, in, in the emerging markets like China, India, Russia, all, you know, Russia suddenly is a big deal. For the first 15 years I was doing this, Russia, sell it for $200,000. Now you really care about the Russian grosses. So um, there's, a, there's kind of uh, a combination of things. Um, that are going on both on a cultural level and on a business level. And the main thing that's happened on a business level is Hollywood says, hey, we're the world leader in this, filmed entertainment. We may be getting our asses kicked in cars, but nobody's kicking our ass in um, making movies. We're way out in front. Let's hold on to that. And the way to stay way out in front is to make sure you're investing in local language product. Um, because what had happened was you started to see that Hollywood would control 70% of the box office. And then some guy would go make a movie that's in Hindi, you know, India is not a great example, but that's in whatever the local language is, and it'd be the and that would be a big number for that market, and so the idea is to grab part of that number too. Um, all right. Thank well, thank you. That was really. Great. Um, Justin, where's the three? Is it in that or here? Are we showing the three from? So I should show it here. And the, we're in the, for the people, and then we'll have a little, whoever's staying for adaptation will stay for adaptation. I don't know when you guys start the movie, part of the movie. Um, I've already talked about adaptation, so I'm not going to do a lot of introducing adaptation. But let me show you, and apologizing in advance for the quality. Um, there's the inventor of the internet. Don't save that. And we'll find our DVD player. Somewhere here. There it is. So no one has seen the no three. And again, with apologies, you may not be able to ch get the last image. You should be able to hear the sound. Remember, the cop is the killer. It, there you go. Thank you.
Take this to the lab for prints. Imagine, Lieutenant. You are born. Three. One plus one plus one equals the fear. <laughs> one plus one plus one equals the terror. How for you, my pet? Hello? Cassie, this is Frank Price from the SFP. Help, please! It's the same thing! I'm so scared! <laughs> Why not? Uh, Lieutenant! That's enough chatting, you two. One plus one plus one equals the three. Yes, Casey, you're safe. Seen only here at Google.